Hi everyone. Good evening. This is Dr. Komal Pancholi, Assistant Professor, University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun. I welcome you all on the exclusive webinar on key emerging technologies, business leaders, and learning. The energy landscape, as we know, is rapidly evolving with technological advancements driving transformative changes in how we generate, distribute, and consume power. Therefore, this webinar is a gateway to understand the innovative solutions and disruptive technologies revolutionizing the power sector. In this dynamic session, we will delve into the forefront of the power industry, exploring cutting edge advancements, novel approaches and groundbreaking innovations that are reshaping the way we harness, manage and utilize energy. From renewable energy sources to grid modernization, energy storage solutions and beyond, we will recover the pivotal role of these emerging technologies in driving the sustainability, reliability, and efficiency in power generation and distribution. I welcome our expert of this webinar, Dr. Naveen Agrawal, who is Assistant Professor of Energy and Finance at UPS on Dehradun. His focused areas are pertaining to electricity market, power sector economics, power pricing, renewable energy, financing, especially financing of energy sector projects, financial modeling, and electricity analytics. He was a consultant in power distribution with a focus of power distribution network, commercial operations, and financial analysis. He has worked on different power distribution projects like R, APDRP, RGGVY, feeder separation, capacity building, and distribution system automation. He obtained his doctorate degree from Terry School of Advanced Studies, Delhi, in the area of energy economics. He holds an MBA in power management from UPES and a bachelor degree in engineering from Rajasthan University. So thank you for being with us in this webinar. Thank you. I, I also welcome Dr. Navdeep Bhatnagar, who is expert and having 15 years of professional experience in the fields of electricity trading, electricity distribution, and management education. He's currently working with the School of Business, UPS, as an assistant professor of senior scale. Before UPS, he worked with BSES, Rajdhani Power Limited, and Reliance Energy Trading Limited. He completed his master's degree in 2008 and his bachelor's degree in 2006. He also serves as a subject matter expert for matters spatially related to electricity trading operations and electricity market regulations. He is also a member of MCX Energy Complex and Electricity Products, Product Advisory Committee as well. Professor Navdeep has published and presented various research papers in different journals and conferences. Let's get prepared to be inspired, informed, and engaged as we embark on a journey to explore the innovations that are shaping the power sector of tomorrow. I request everyone, if you have any questions in between the webinar, just drop it in the chat box so that at the end of the webinar, we will try to address as many questions as time permits. So thank you, uh, Professor Navdeep and Professor Nav Naveen for uh, this webinar. We will start with uh, the questions uh, which I want to ask, because as we know that power sector industry is on boom this time. So uh, I first raise my question to uh, Dr. Naveen. Sir, uh, what do you think? What is the current state of power sector industry in India? 
Okay, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kamal, for this uh, uh, introduction and uh, giving us this opportunity. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, it is okay? Yes, sir. Um, okay, okay. So, uh, question pertaining to this, uh, the status of the power sector uh, in Indian context. Uh, uh, currently, the power sector industry in India specifically, it is going in a uh, significant development. Uh, if I talk about first uh, the power generation in India, uh, there is a diverse mix in the power generation technologies like uh, coal, uh, there is hydro, there is gas, so, uh, there is uh, nuclear energy, and we have renewable energy sources also. Uh, total installed capacity we talk about, uh, which is around more than uh, which is more than 400 gigawatt, and precisely I say uh, 416 gigawatt. Uh, out of that, uh, coal has uh, more than 50 percent. Uh, so you can say out of 416 gigawatt, more than 200 gigawatt is from the coal only. Uh, if I talk about the renewable energy, so there's a lot of promotional activities are happening uh, for the uh, renewable energy capacity addition, and particularly for the solar and wind power. India has a target, uh, which is a very ambitious target, which is uh, addition of 450 gigawatt uh, by 2030. And uh, for that, government has introduced various, various policies uh, and initiatives to attract investment in the renewable energy projects. Now, if I talk about uh, the energy transition, uh, so Indian power sector is gradually transitioning towards the clean in a source of energy. Uh, in that, uh, and uh, for uh, that government is phasing out uh, the thermal power plants and uh, adopting the various advanced technologies to reduce the green um, uh, greenhouse gases or the emissions. Now, if I talk about the distribution sector, which is a very important or very important part of the overall power sector value chain, uh, which so in that uh, distribution sector reforms as a distribution sector which is facing uh, the lot of challenges, especially the financial viability uh, related to the losses, uh, technical losses, your uh, uh, theft, ATNC losses. So all these are the very big challenges for uh, not only the power distribution but for the overall. Power overall power sector, Indian power sector specifically. To address actually these issues, government has done a lot of uh, things. So they started uh, uh, different schemes like uh, RPDRP, then they came up uh, with the IPDS, and they started a scheme, uh, the usual discounts assurance huge now, with the scheme to reduce the, the losses and bring out the operational efficiency in the distribution sector. Uh, now, if I talk about the rural ele rural electrification, which is a, a very important uh, aspect for the overall power sector, because a uh, seventy percent population or more than sixty percent population stays in the rural or uh, villages, so that's why electrification of the rural part is very important. And uh, for that, uh, the government started a scheme like Sobhagi scheme. Uh, to uh, basically the rural electrification, uh, especially the households in the rural areas. Now, if I uh, talk about, so basically you can see the significant progress has been uh, made in the uh, bringing electric uh, electricity to previously unconnected households. If uh, if I talk about uh, in the rural rural electrification, on the energy efficiency uh, front. Uh, the government has uh, done, or uh, they have focused on various schemes like uh, building codes. Uh, they have uh, done a lot of jobs into the energy audits, energy labeling, so and funding for uh, research and development, and uh, uh, for the electric week, uh, electric vehicle part. So these are the things which government has been doing, or they are doing very extensively. So overall, if you see the from generation from uh, generation to distribution to the rural electrification 
to re distribution reform, so in terms of the energy efficiency. There are a lot of transition and a lot of work is happening in the overall power sector, Indian power sector. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Naveen, uh, for letting us know the current status of uh, power sector industry in India. As you mentioned that not only in the urban part, but in uh, rural areas also, power sector industry is doing a lot. So thanks for letting us know. Uh, my next question is to Professor Navdeep. Sir, please let us know how is the power sector industry responding to the increasing demand for renewable energy? As we know that demand for renewable energy is increasing on a great pace. So just highlight this for our uh, students. Okay. So um, thank you, Dr. Komus, for having me here and for that wonderful introduction. Thank you. Uh, coming to uh, the demand for renewable energy, right? So now, <clears throat> excuse me. The, one of the basic problems that we saw in the way recent past was that the distribution company specifically, they were apprehensive in purchasing renewable energy due to different factors and different reasons. However, over the last couple of years, if I talk about it, the power industry has responded very positively or in a very positive manner towards the use of renewable energy. The government through its various schemes and various policies, they have been in a position to increase the demand for renewable energy. And along with that, and subsequently, the kind of supply that has been there, that has also increased. Now, the, since we're talking about the manner in which the power industry has uh, responded, the key element here would be the investment. Now, since, um, or if I take the last one decade, for instance, so starting from 2010, maybe till 2020, we have seen a lot of investment going into the renewable energy side. We have seen newer generating stations coming up. We have seen uh, solar power. We have seen wind power. We have seen alternate sources of energy, all of them being developed. And the fact is that the rate at which the renewable energy is developing is really, really unprecedented. Specifically, if I talk about the independent power producers. Now, the kind of investment that has been introduced by the independent power producers into renewables over the last one decade is immense. And the situation is that, whereas at one point of time, Dr. Naveen was just talking about the installed capacity of the country. So at one point of time, um, renewable energy was a very small percentage of the total installed capacity. But Today, if you look at it, renewable energy has actually become the second largest source of, obviously, the, all, all the renewable energy sources they have become the second largest source. Along with that, there has also been a lot of policy support from the government. Now, over the years, the government has framed policies, the government has uh, introduced various uh, acts, various uh, policies in order to support that renewable energy. So the government is also uh, responding in a very positive manner. Along with that, a lot of grid integration is introduced. Now with renewable energy, the one problem that the distribution companies were once facing at one point of time was that there was the supply that was coming from renewable energy was slightly erratic in terms. Like for instance, if I talk about solar energy, now solar energy obviously can be generated only during the daytime when the sun is shining. Right. So with that, um, storage facilities were introduced so that the power could be stored and then it can be used at times when the power can actually not be generated. Along with that, a lot of demand integration and a lot of demand generation has been introduced. Like for instance, um, again, uh, <clears throat> We've been talking about the electric vehicles. Now, we do understand the fact that the electric vehicles have been introduced in order to reduce the carbon footprint of the company, uh, of the country, right? And um, in order to uh, phase out the conventional fuel vehicles, where whether it was diesel, whether it was petrol, whether it was any other fuel that was being used to run those vehicles and, and emitting carbon. So, electric vehicles to a certain extent have been in a position to 
reduce that carbon footprint. But along with that, specifically uh, relying on renewable energy for providing those charging facilities or the charging infrastructure for the renewable uh, for the electric vehicles was another factor that was, that has actually added on to the acceptability of renewable power. Right. Along with that, uh, again, uh, not to forget about the fact that a lot of technological advancements have gone into the sector. Right. And specifically, if I talk about uh, probably a couple of decades back when we were running thermal generating stations at a low efficiency and a, at a low plant uh, load factor of maybe 60, 65%, the kind of technological advancements that we have seen have actually changed the entire game. Solar power, again, one, one more area that has seen a lot of technological advancements. Um, solar power selling at a tariff of close to 12 rupees per unit almost a decade back and selling at less than 3 rupees per unit as on date. Right? That is the sheer um, technological advancements that we have seen. We have seen uh, changes in the material that is being used for manufacture of solar panels. We've seen a lot of technological advancements in, in these areas. So overall, if I see uh, the power sector has been responding very positively, the power sector is positive. The integration of renewable energy into the supply code or the supply of electricity is happening. And this is something that will increase in the near future. As we go on, we are adding more capacity of renewable energy to the India's installed capacity. Our reliability on thermal power specifically and coal-based thermal power is going down. The distribution companies are adopting various policies that will encourage consumers to kind of consume renewable energy. So in the near future also, we see a lot of support to renewables from the power sector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nardeep. So how well you to explain that how we are meeting the increasing demand for renewable energy, what are the various things which we are focusing on, on thermal power plant, on solar plant and everything. The great, uh, the great description of the EVs, especially you had given the example for that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navdeep, for uh, getting an insight into this uh, demand and supply of these renewable energy. Uh, my next question is to you, Professor Navde Naveen. Um, how are new technologies such as smart grids and energy storage systems changing the power sector industry? Or I can say, what are the emerging trends which we can see in the power industry these days? Uh, very important question which you have asked uh, Dr. Kamal. Uh, because smart grid, uh, IoT, energy storage, which are the, the new technologies which are emerging into the uh, power sector, especially in the Indian power sector. So uh, technologies like uh, smart grid, uh, energy storage systems. Uh, so actually these technologies are transforming uh, the power industry, especially in different ways. So now if I talk about the smart grid, which helps in uh, integrate advanced communication in controlling uh, and uh, automization into traditional power grids. Other than that, it uh, enable the two-way flow of communication and uh, two-way flow of electric uh, electricity and you can say the information between the power generation, uh, transmission and distribution and consumption. And uh, basically because of all these features, there are various benefits which we can take like uh, improvement in the reliability of uh, electricity, by uh, detecting and isolating faults, so uh, minimizing downtimes and restoring power faster during the outages. Now, if I talk about the uh, the next benefit, uh, uh, which is very important, uh, and that is the smart grid actually enable the demand response programs. Uh, in the demand response program, uh, basically uh, you shift the electricity demand from peak time to the off peak time so that you can average out the overall electricity load. So basically this smart grid programs actually enable the demand response programs uh, and uh, in that consumers are actually uh, allowed to adjust their electricity usage uh, for the different price signals and uh, according to the grid conditions. 
it also helps in uh, electricity uh, or balancing the demand and supply of electricity. Uh, it also reduces the peak demand and uh, which helps in avoiding grid overloading. So that whenever, so that if we are shifting the peak demand to the off-peak demand, so that we don't need to actually uh, strengthen or increase our transmission and distribution capacity according to the peak load. There are also other benefits of the smart grid or uh, like the integration of renewable energy, which is very much required uh, to encourage these resources. Because we all know that uh, uh, in the renewable energy, there is a problem of the intermittency. Sometimes there is generation, sometimes there is no generation and it all depends on the weather because if, if we talk about the, uh, the solar power, sun is shining, you can get the electricity, there is electricity generation. If it is not, then you don't get. So by doing the real time, uh, the monitoring uh, doing by uh, enabling the smart grid, or implementation smart grid, there is real-time monitoring which can be possible. And uh, also you can optimize uh, the electricity generation and consumption. So basically you can manage the intermittency of solar and uh, wind power uh, to say in the efficient manner. Now the next uh, from the smart grid, the next technology that is the energy storage uh, uh, Dr. Navdeep has also talked about that. Uh, uh, so in case of the energy systems, uh, which is actually play a crucial role in the overall power sector. Why? Because it addresses the problems like intermittency and uh, the variability of uh, the renewable energy. Just I was talking about that. And it can subsequently improve the grid stability. And uh, it also has it also helps in uh, the peak load management, uh, and uh, so basically it can be used as a backup during the outages. So in overall, if you see these technologies like smart grid and energy storage are instrumental in uh, transforming the power sector, power industry uh, by enabling the integration uh, of renewable energy, and uh, it improves the grid efficiency. Uh, grid enhancing also grid resilience, uh, then empowering consumers. So the consumers can become the prosumers. So where the consumers can produce and also can consume. And uh, so in overall energy ecosystem can be uh, transformed. So their adoption is uh, expected in the future to increase. And uh, there will be cost also. And uh, But the cost is continue to decline because a lot of R&D is happening. So we can uh, we can actually expect that uh, the cost is going to decline in the future, and uh, it can drive a cleaner and uh, more reliable and sustainable energy future. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Naveen, for highlighting the emerging technologies which are going on in the power sector. And the thing which you highlighted the most that cost would be declining in near future. So that's great insight. Thank you. Uh, my next question is to you, Professor Navdeep. What are the global power sector trends that have yet to be adopted in India, which has not adopted yet? So what do you suggest that uh, these uh, trends which are going on in the international market, we should adopt in India as well? Okay. So, um... Dr. Komal, let me tell you, if we kind of compare the entire power sector of a particular country to the human life cycle, right? So now, uh, when we talk about the Indian power sector as such, uh, in many instances and in many occasions, the Indian power sector has specifically been referred as an infant who is still crawling as compared to the European power markets or for that matter, the U.S. power markets. So that that is that is that is where uh, we stand. And then these, uh, when I talk about the European power market, or when I talk about the Australian power market or U.S. power market, these are already mature markets. So that is that is where we can kind of compare. And um, to answer this particular question, what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll talk about the various issues that 
the Indian power sector is facing, and those issues have already been addressed in the international markets to a greater extent. Now, in this scenario, the first problem that we are facing is with regards to large scale power storage. Now, uh, even though, yes, I would say that India is definitely working towards uh, storage of electricity and specifically uh, coming from a situation where at one point of time, electricity was a commodity that was specifically referred as a commodity that needs to be consumed the moment it is generated. Otherwise, it goes waste. And coming from that scenario all the way to a scenario where we can store that electricity, right? So that is definitely commendable on uh, part of the entire power sector. But then what we are talking about is electricity, uh, energy storage or electricity storage at higher capacities where we can actually look forward to probably meeting the demand of an entire city, right, an entire area. So that is probably what we are looking at. The second problem that I feel uh, specifically with regards to India, and again, uh, uh, an area where <clears throat> the international or different countries have already progressed to a greater extent is the electric vehicle infrastructure. Now, we do definitely talk about the fact that India needs to become an electric vehicle nation, an EV nation, the kind of uh, pollution that we are looking at, the kind of air quality index of various cities that we are looking at. Delhi has already been named uh, as, as one of the most polluted cities, right? So definitely moving towards electric vehicles would definitely reduce that pollution levels. But then the problem lies with where is the infrastructure? Where is the charging infrastructure? I do understand that if I talk about uh, local travel, uh, travel within the limits of the cities, then definitely uh, charging that vehicle at home or at a fixed point is possible. But then we are not just limiting that travel to the local travel, the travel within the city, we are also looking at uh, travel between cities. Right? And that is where the infrastructure is lacking. On many occasions, I've, I've been traveling between cities and then uh, probably being uh, a part of the power sector, I've been looking at uh, the charging infrastructure available or the status of the charging infrastructure. Available. And trust me, um, this is one area that that has uh, uh, that has been totally neglected. That like we don't have the right kind of infrastructure. We don't have the charging stations available. If at all, there are charging stations. There are probably one or two charging stations where the pricing of power is erratic depending upon what time of the day you are probably charging your vehicle, uh, they're charging the money from you, right? There's no fixed policy that could actually define that. Okay, fine. If you're charging electric vehicle, uh, then the amount of units that you consume and what will be the charges that you'll be paying. Again, uh, <clears throat> since uh, both of us, uh, Dr. Naveen and me, both of us come from the electricity sector and uh, we've seen quite a lot of uh, the sector in that side. Again, something that uh, Dr. Naveen just mentioned about was demand response programs. So the demand response programs that are there, that are run in various countries are not present in India. We do understand, and, and this is something as we are approaching the festive season, we'll see uh, huge variations in uh, uh, the voltages in the, in the power that is supplied. That, that is one problem that we'll be looking at. Uh, power cuts are very frequent. There are a lot of cities, there are a lot of countries that do not get more than 10 to 12 hours of regular power supply. Right? And 24 by 7 power supply, at least uh, the base load requirements of a particular city or a village or a town is something that we've been focusing on. One more area where I feel that India is not stressing enough is towards the energy efficiency. We do understand the fact that energy efficiency is one area that can actually save a lot of energy for us. But again, the kind of focus that is required on the energy efficiency services is something that is not present. We do understand that the Bureau of Energy Efficiency has already defined star rating for various appliances. But then when the common man goes out to buy that particular appliance, whether he's actually interested in buying the star rated appliance or he's willing to buy that non-star rated appliance just because it's slightly cheaper. That, that, is, that is one area that I think. So again, uh, there are a lot of areas that, that if I go into it and if I start dwelling on it, 
there'll be multiple areas but these these are the key areas that i feel need immediate attention if in case we want the power sector of the country to go at leaps and bounds thank you thank you dr navdeep for highlighting the key areas of challenge with respect to the uh, india so these uh, challenges uh, are majorly you focused on four uh, which is one is electricity storage the second one is uh, ev infrastructure third one is demand response management and the last one is energy efficiency so thank you for highlighting these challenges and i hope india would uh, you know in near future overcome with these challenges uh thank you thank you for highlighting these uh my next question is to you uh, dr navin uh, some new concepts which are emerging in the specifically with, with respect to indian power sector and there is lot of discussion going on on market coupling and gna which are uh, the new terminologies so let's discuss on this what is your view on that and are these new concepts would help in the growth of power sector what do you think okay so uh, thank you first of all dr kamal for bringing this uh, question actually this is very again a important uh, and why i'm saying that uh, this is very important because there nowadays uh, uh, it's actually very hot topic for the entire uh, indian power sector mm -hmm. uh, because these are the emerging concepts which are coming into the indian power sector even uh, recently i wrote a article on uh, this especially the market coupling that why uh, the india needs uh, the uh, the market coupling so uh, basically the objective of uh, these concepts uh, overall both uh, market coupling and uh, the gna gna basically the general network access uh, the objective is to enhancing the efficiency and uh, uh, the secondly is to increase the competition in the indian power sector if i talk about the market coupling actually it uh, integrate and uh, harmonize actually the electricity market across all the regions and uh, it actually improves the price discovery which actually also uh, you can say the increase the resource the utilization and uh, so overall increase the market competition so basically in market coupling what happens that uh, price discovery uh, which currently discovered uh, at each price uh, price exchange separately so there are three exchanges in india uh, one is iex indian energy exchange uh, second pxil power exchange india limited which is based in mumbai and third uh, which was recently started that was that is hpx hindustan power exchange so price discovered uh, in the aid market okay uh, at each exchange separately so every at every exchange uh, price is dis discovered but in market coupling a single price will be discovered and that will be applicable for all the exchanges so what is and why it is required and what is the main benefit of this uh, the market coupling that a better price because there will be more trading value volume in this uh, exercise and so a better price would be discovered and that would be applicable for the entire india and across all the regions so this is basically all about the market coupling now if uh, i talk about gna and uh, this is general network access which was just started from uh, this uh, 30th of september uh, basically it uh, ensure the non discriminatory access to the power grid uh, which provide the equal opportunities for all the market uh, participants in the power sector of power trading and uh, actually in this regulation suppliers are not uh, required to purchase transmission capacity which was earlier required and uh, instead of that they only need to notify that which is the what would be the injection point and that would be to the ctuil that would be the, uh, the ctuil or uh, this is central transmission utility india limited that would be the nodal agency in this case for the overall operation of the injection sorry uh, the gn and the buyer that must uh, uh, the acquire the transmission network capacity and additionally they will have to inform the what is the withdrawal point 
So uh, if I take uh, uh, an example that uh, uh, for this uh, to understand the GNA or general network access, uh, so suppose uh, there is a buyer and uh, which purchase a capacity of 1000 MBA in the transmission network. So they can utilize any transmission line in the country with a capacity of up to 100 or sorry, 1000 uh, MBA. But previously, when they had to buy the capacity for a specific transmission line, they were obligated to pay uh, the utilize, they were actually obligated to pay for both the transmission capacity, even if they are not utilize fully capacity of that allocated transmission line due to any reason. And uh, they are using the other transmission line. So in, in the earlier case, they were supposed to pay for both the transmission line. First, the transmission line for which they purchase the capacity. And the second, the line in actual at the delivery time they are using. So for both the transmission lines, they, for both the transmission capacity, they were supposed to pay. So now they are in this GNA, they, they have to only use the, they have only have to pay for one single transmission capacity. So if these concepts are effectively, the main important is the implementation. And uh, so if these things or these concepts are effectively implemented and uh, with the accordance of the regulatory framework and uh, infrastructure development. So I'm sure that these concepts, these both, uh, the market coupling and the, the GNA, the next GNA, they have potential for the uh, promote the growth, the competition, which is very much required in the power sector and a sustainable development in the power sector, the Indian power sector. However, their succeeds uh, or their success, it is it depends on the collaborative, uh, the efforts between the different the government bodies, uh, the regulators, uh, the CRC, the SERC, the exchanges, low dispatch centers. So these are the different bodies. So there is a collaborative approach is required between these stakeholders, so that. Uh, whatever the challenges arising in implementation, they can address simultaneously and uh, together and effective, uh, effective uh, the outcome can be seen. So this is all about uh, the, the GNA and the market coupling, uh, Dr. Kombal. And I'm sure the audience, uh, because these are the very new concepts and a uh, lot of things are still going on. And uh, so our listeners, I'm, I'll suggest that our listeners can go much deeper into that and uh, uh, get some more knowledge about that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Naveen, for uh, letting us know about these two uh, new terminologies, market coupling and GNA. And I hope the, your discussion is very useful for all the attendees. I had also gone through the article which was <laughs> written by you on LinkedIn, and that article also gave a very insight into the market coupling. So that was well written. And these new, uh, you know, new to topics, I can say, these new things are very important to understand the power sector. Uh, so yes, thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, Prof Professor Navdeep, coming to you, as I am from economics Okay. background. So I have a keen interest mm -hmm. in uh, knowing the impact of uh, power sector industry uh, on the economic aspects, especially uh, with respect to the job market. So could you highlight a bit on this? Okay. So again, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, the basic point that I started off, uh, or rather the first question that you put across to me, and in that particular case, I had asked, uh, I had answered about the investment being introduced into the power sector. And since uh, we know about the fact that investment leads to capital building, right? And the capital building basically, uh, <clears throat> it, it shows what kind of economic growth a particular country is looking at. The more the investment, the more the capital formation and more ultimately is the economic growth. So that would be uh, the first first uh, point that I can say that in, in terms of impact on the economy, so there is a lot of economic growth associated with the kind of investment that is introduced into the power sector. 
The second part to this is uh, specifically related to revenue. Uh, we do understand the fact that uh, uh, power sector is an activity, it's an economic activity that involves supply of a particular commodity right, to the consumers and the consumers end up paying towards that uh, commodity. So there's a lot of revenue generation, right? people pay towards it. Um, the, this revenue ultimately in turn goes into investment into various other sectors. Right? It's not just the power sector, but there are multiple sectors that are benefited out of the total revenue that the government gets. So, right. so that is another part to it. The third part, according to me, uh, <clears throat> would be energy exports. So since uh, we are talking about, and since we are talking about economic development, and since uh, the exports and imports of various commodities does affect the overall economic growth. So here we consider uh, electricity as another uh, commodity, just like other commodities that are exported. And we, when we talk about the neighboring countries, and then since, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if I talk about uh, India specifically, so today we have contracts going on with Bangladesh, we have contracts going on with Nepal, We've been importing electricity from uh, Bhutan for quite some time now, right? And there were discussions in uh, <clears throat> regarding supply of electricity to some other neighboring countries as well, right? So exports is another part uh, that is that is there. <clears throat> another part that I probably feel is that if we have uninterrupted power supply and we have cheap power supply and reliable power supply available. That is something that will always benefit the industrial sector. The industrial sector or the manufacturing sector basically can benefit out of that uninterrupted power supply. And that will be another indicator of uh, <clears throat> economic growth. Dr. Gomal, could you please uh, repeat the second part of the question that you were asking? All this in regards with the job market. Okay. <clears throat> so coming back to the job market. Now, uh, we do understand the fact that uh, when, when uh, electricity is generated, when it's transmitted, when it's supplied to the consumer, there is a lot of direct employment that is generated. We have teams working into power generation. We have teams working into um, the transmission side, then the distribution side. And then within the distribution, there are multiple activities that go on. Then we also have... Uh, maintenance activity. So there's a lot of direct employment that is generated from the power sectors. And since we have been uh, kind of introducing or we've been using power for quite a lot of industries, so there's a lot of induced and indirect uh, employment as well. Because when the power is supplied to a particular industry, that particular industry will also generate employment. Right? So to my uh, to my view, that is that is the basic impact on the economic side as well as the job market. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Navdeep, uh, for letting us know the impact on the uh, economic uh, side of our country with respect to the power sector. So as you told, uh, for Indian economy, uh, power sector is helping in uh, revenue uh, because as we know, circular flow of economy is there. So revenue is generated and it is helping in uh, the other investments as well. The second one is the export promotion, as you mentioned. So export, uh, which is actually maintaining our uh, balance of payment conditions. So power sector is helping a lot for our BOP uh, conditions. And the third one, uh, which you highlighted, is the uh, for industrial sector. The power which we, uh, if the power gets cheaper in our country, then it will help the industrial sector. And as we know, the industrial sector plays a very important role for the entire economy. So these are the aspects uh, you shared uh, with us uh, regarding the economic and regarding the job market, uh, you told that there is direct and indirect uh, job creation, uh, employment opportunities, which is there uh, from the power sector. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navdeep. Uh, um, my next question is to you, uh, Professor Naveen. What do you think? What is the future outlook we can see for power sector industry with respect to the growth and innovation which is going on? Okay. Um, so growth and innovation. Uh, <clears throat> so if you see, uh, okay. So if you see overall uh, the uh, the future outlook for the power sector. 
I can say, uh, and especially the uh, regarding the Portuguese and all, I'll say that is very promising. And uh, because there are a lot of opportunities, innovations and, and uh, growth, which is happening in the sector. Uh, there has been talk about the renewable energy earlier as well in the uh, last question by even uh, Dr. Navdeep also discussed that uh, uh, if we see the renewable energy or renewable energy sector with the growth, uh, which is expected to be continued because we know that uh, there is a target of 450 gigawatt additional capacity we have to get by 2030. So the growth is uh, going to be there in the renewable energy sector. Uh, the factors which are driving uh, the, uh, for this the growth of renewable energy sector are uh, first the, the falling of the cost of renewable energy technologies. So here even... Uh, uh, I remember that around six, seven to eight years back when there was a the generation price from the solar power plant around eight to what eight to ten rupees per unit, which has gone come down to the uh, three rupees or four rupees per unit. Even the lesser than you can see the thermal power plant or the generation from the thermal power plant. Next uh, is the uh, which is driving the renewable energy sector. That is the advancement in the energy storage. Because energy storage, which is solving the problem of the intermittency of the renewable energy. And uh, that also increase the, uh, the capacity utilization factor of the overall renewable energy power plant. And uh, there are policies from the government, uh, uh, which is also encouraging the sector. The next uh, big move, or say the transformation of the power sector is the decentralization of power, power generation. Because that actually the empower the consumers, uh, enhance uh, the grid resilience, uh, and also reduce that technical transmission technical losses because there is no uh, transmission line, the long transmission line in case of the de decentralization of the power generation technology. The technologies like uh, smart grid, uh, the technologies like uh, digitization, blockchain, the power sector. So all these technologies actually will help uh, the integration of renewable energy and uh, will help in the implementation of demand response program, which, were, which we discussed earlier also. And also uh, in the grid management, better grid management. After this, uh, I can say the next uh, big move, which is the electric vehicle. And uh, that is also expected to grow subsequently or very uh, extensive growth we can see in the next uh, this electric vehicle though there are challenges like what uh, dr navdeep also discussed that uh, the infrastructure we need the infrastructure especially for the power charging sorry electric vehicle charging so that we have to address but there is a lot of opportunities in electric vehicle and uh, that will overall create the new challenges and same time the opportunity opportunities in the power sector. Uh, there will be challenges like uh, the more electricity demand, more and more, and which we have to manage also because uh, there because of electric increasing the electric vehicle, there will be uh, the demand electricity demand will increase and also the managing that electricity demand because sometimes you are. Uh, feeding the electricity into the grid. Sometime you are getting or you are charging your electric vehicle. So there will be, it is very important to manage the grid. So there, will, there would be opportunities like uh, uh, the in the charging infrastructure and also the technologies like V2G, vehicle to grid. Okay, and uh, which means uh, the vehicle to grid technology that uh, basically enable the demand response. So earlier we were discussing of the demand response program or demand response technologies. So vehicle to grid technology, the, these technologies actually will uh, enable the de demand response program because whenever there is a peak load or there is a peak demand, the price of the electricity can be increased. Okay, and this, that time the the batteries which are being used into the electric vehicles can feed electricity back into the grid. And whenever there is off peak time, the prices can be reduced. And that time, all those batteries can be charged. 
So actually these technologies, V2G and the electric vehicle that will enable the demand response program. Other than that, energy efficiency, demand side management, uh, the use of AI, artificial intelligence, which is again a very prominent area into the power sector, cybersecurity. Uh, so I'll say that all these new technologies are coming. They are, uh, all these innovations are coming in the power sector. And have, obviously these, uh, the some work is already going on, but more is to come. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naveen, uh, for letting us know that how is the future outlook of power sector industry uh, seems to be with respect to the growth and innovation. Now, could you just highlight a bit? I, I, I want to elaborate a bit on the topic that what kind of career opportunities you can see in the power management industry? So, uh, there are a lot of opportunities in the power management industry. And uh, especially for the the uh, the one who has done MBA in the power management, uh, opportunities in the power generation, power distribution, they can work as a energy project manager, uh, who can see actually the planning, implementation, and uh, execution of the power sector power related projects actually. Other than that, uh, they can work as a energy consultant uh, in different areas like. Uh, energy management uh, strategies, sustainability, power distribution, tariff, like tariff filing, energy, the regulatory compliance, uh, and in the renewable energy. Other than the consulting, uh, the next, uh, the role which uh, a power management person can do, which is the analyst, as a market analyst, energy market analyst. Uh, in that basically they will be responsible for uh, the monitoring uh, and uh, the analyzing the overall energy sector, basically the power sector, um, demand supply dynamics, uh, the pricing and uh, the regulatory aspects. And also they can do the market research, market research of the power sector. Also, uh, there is a very promising area and that is the business development. Business development in the power sector, they can, uh, there are areas like power trading, renewable energy. So in all these areas, there is a need of number of business development people. Okay. Uh, which is a business development person, which is actually, it plays a very, you know, uh, very crucial role in, uh, you know, expanding the new markets. Uh, um, and whenever there's a new product is launching uh, in the service area, so actually, it's to the business development that actually drive the the revenue of the company. Uh, other than that, uh, they can work as a renewable energy manager, okay, to work uh, uh, in the implementation of projects, uh, regulatory compliance. That's again a very promising and very vast area where the energy MBA power management uh, person can do project financing. So these are the different areas. They can work as a uh, policy analyst, uh, sustainability manager. So these are the different career opportunities, which I'll say that uh, a uh, the MBA power management person can do. Thank you. Which, uh, wow, how greatly you explained, which means uh, there are too many opportunities one has if you have the MBA in power management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naveen. Uh, my next question is to you, Professor Navdeep. What are the skills which are required to join the power industry? Because as we know, uh, as uh, Professor Naveen has uh, described to us, that there are so many opportunities one has in power management. But um, getting those opportunities, what are the skills which are required by the one? So just share your highlight on this. Okay. <clears throat> so again, um... Uh, Dr. Naveen very beautifully mentioned the various uh, profiles that a student with an MBA power management degree can probably work in. And now each, most or other, I would say all of these profiles and all of these uh, job titles that you mentioned would definitely require some specific skill, skill sets that a student needs to understand. So if he's going as a regulatory manager, he should have a keen interest in reading regulations, understanding what is the implication of those regulations and what will be the kind of change that will be implemented once that 
regulation is introduced or it is implemented in the market. Right. So similarly, these these different jobs would have uh, different uh, skill sets that would be required. But then there are certain skill sets that I would say will be common for almost all the job, job profiles in the different sectors that, that a student could probably go in. <clears throat> one one uh, would be um, understanding of the technicals of the power generation. So now that that is that is one thing that that you need to understand because uh, we're talking about power, we're talking about kilowatt, we're talking about megawatt, we're talking about kilowatt hour. So all those things, the technical side of it, what is the plant load factor, all those things, and, and more than that, not only understanding these terms, more than that, I would say understanding the implication of these terms onto the power sector as well. So if, if and, and this is something uh, that probably if I say uh, Dr. Naveen would understand and if he says I would understand that if a plant is running at a plant load factor of 70%, now we do understand that what exactly that, that uh, terminology or that particular statement means. But more than that, we also understand that what's the implication of, of this situation on the overall power scenario. Right. So first, first part would be the technical side of it. The second would be the data analytics. Now, again, power sector is one area. This is one market that generates a lot of data. And if a student has that skill set of understanding the data, analyzing it, and then getting some useful information out of it, then definitely such a student would definitely be an asset to the organization wherever he's working. Right. The third part would be critical thinking. Now, most of the times we find ourselves, and when we are working in the power sector, we find ourselves in situations that needs very deep critical thinking to actually get out of that particular situation. Whether it's regarding the power supply, whether it's regarding availability of power, the prices at, uh, at which the power is being available, multiple factors. So the most important part would be the critical thinking tool. If the student can think about it, think about a solution that can probably Add on to uh, add on some value to the organization that he's working in, then definitely that would be another skill set. Right. So uh, I I feel that these are the three primary skill sets that a student is having. In any case, other than this, uh, if I talk about uh, like like uh, Naveen mentioned about uh, business development. So when you're talking about business development, then definitely you should have a great acumen about uh, or great acumen for meeting people, traveling quite a lot. Right, going out to places, uh, attending meetings, so that that would be another skill set that would be required. Same goes with um, the kind of long working hours that sometimes uh, the power professionals are exposed to. So if you're working on a generating station, then there's a possibility that the kind of shift that you're working on could be extended to 16 or 18 hours. So again, that is another skill that, that the student might need if he wants to work on a generating station. So again, as I said, uh, Different profiles would require different skill sets, but to my uh, <clears throat> understanding, these are the primary skills that are required that probably a student, if a student has acquired, he'll be comfortably working in any any of the profiles that he's offered. Thanks, uh, Dr. Navdeep, uh, for letting us know the skill set required uh, to be uh, grabbing any opportunities as discussed by Professor Naveen uh, in the power sector. My last question to you, uh, Dr. Naveen, is how uh, does UPS on MBA in power management program fulfill the requirement for the candidates to explore or grasp these opportunities which are available in the power industry as, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, explained by you? Uh, this, to, uh, this question is to me, uh, Dr. Kamal or uh, Dr. Naveen. Uh, this is to you. This is to you. Okay. 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 Uh, so, uh, very specific question, and uh, I'll give very specific answer for that. Uh, that how the UPS on uh, uh, can actually help uh, to grasp all these uh, things or uh, the uh, the areas, the concepts. So. MBA in power management by UPS on actually I'll say a few things so uh, that here we provide uh, the interactive live sessions which are actually by the industry experts and uh, 
from the experienced faculty. And uh, other than the sessions, live sessions, a discussion forums are provided uh, to the students. And uh, where they are encouraged uh, to provide, to discuss whatever the current scenarios, whatever the happening in the power sector. And uh, a robust learning management system, which is LMS, is provided to the students where they can see all the recorded things, uh, uh, the live sessions, uh, uh, quizzes, and uh, all the discussions which can be done at that learning management system. Other than that, uh, a project is given to them, which a student has to complete and uh, other than that, case studies, which can give, which actually give the uh, the real exposure, the life exposure and the real scenarios of the Indian power sector. Other than that, uh, there is a dedicated support system, student support system, uh, overall, which handle, which is kind of uh, the hand holding support kind of, you can say. Also, uh, we encourage to students come in the live sessions, which are conducted on the weekends. Though the sessions are recorded and uh, provided for the future reference to the students. So if uh, they want to refer those sessions for the in the future, they can refer. Also, there are subjects uh, like uh, a domain subjects in the power sector, like uh, uh, financial modeling of power projects, uh, power pricing, power economics, uh, power trading, power station management, the power sector regulations. So all these are, which are very important subjects or domain subjects for the power sector. So all these are the subjects. But there are also subjects like uh, the marketing. There are subjects like finance, HR, operations. So which are extra in line with the domain subjects. Additionally, we provide doubt clearing sessions for these students. So other than the live sessions, there are doubt clearing sessions. So where the, in that those sessions, the student can come and uh, whatever the doubts they have, that can be put in that session or in the doubt clearing session. So these are the different, uh, you can say, uh, the facilities or the support which is provided to a student for the MBA or MBA power management. Yes, so, so this is all about uh, the whatever the, the things which are provided from the UPS on. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nagar, you. for letting us know uh, that how UPS on helps uh, in, uh, uh, in creating those skills which are required to grab the opportunities uh, which are available in power sector. So um, time is already up, but we are having certain questions with us. So we'll try to address few of them. Uh, there is one question uh, which is from Chandan Kumar. Uh, kindly throw some light on green hydrogen production and power supply from renewable sources and upcoming projects across India. So basically, uh, he is asking regarding the green hydrogen production and the power supply with respect to the renewable sources. So could you please answer? So, uh, Dr. Devin, would you like to take it up? Okay. So uh, here uh, in the green hydrogen and the green uh, renewable energy, so the projects, uh, I would like to say, India is extensively working in this sector. And uh, the green hydrogen, uh, that's a very new area. Uh, yet uh, it is not a mature technology and a lot of work is still going on. A uh, lot of research is still going on because uh, the efficiency is a very important criteria or a very important factor in the green hydrogen case. But uh, that's a cleaner energy. And uh, once uh, we will have the mature maturity or we will get a mature technology in this in the hydrogen then i'm sure that india is going to get a big leap into that uh, i remember one of my friend uh, they did uh, a, they basically they made a hydrogen uh, they did a hydrogen they worked on a hydrogen cell and uh, they are still working there is a company i i will i will not 
take the name of that company right now, but uh, they are still working on that. And uh, uh, just a few days back, uh, I was having words with them and they are saying that uh, uh, still the work is going on and uh, uh, there's a lot of focus because a new hydrogen policy uh, has already uh, come up uh, by the Indian government. Uh, so a big leap is going to come, a new number of projects are going to come. Uh, the second word about the renewable energy, right? So as I uh, mentioned that uh, the 450 gigawatt, that is the uh, the objective or that is the target by 2030 by the government of India. So each and every company, whether it's uh, the company is in the, the coal thermal projects or thermal uh, technology or the company is in the, even the oil company, Company. They all the companies are diversifying their portfolio into the renewable energy projects. So right now the capacity has reached to more than 250. Uh, you can say uh, the currently is 40 percent, so around uh, 230 or 240 gigawatt uh, we have reached. And additionally, so you can say uh, in next last 15 to 16 years we have reached the capacity by two. 200 or two, sorry, 230 gigawatt, but the next seven to eight years, we have to add double to that. So now you, one can imagine that how many projects uh, or how many, uh, the new opportunities, which is going to come in the renewable energy or in the green hydrogen. Very well explained by you, uh, Dr. Naveen. We are having one more question uh, from Rupali. Uh, she is asking, would uh, non-engineers be able to learn the technical language uh, during the power management specialization if we don't have any science background? Okay. So, uh, Dr. Naveed, I would like to answer that. And uh, the reason why I would like to answer that is uh, I've worked in the power sector for almost a decade. And uh, let me tell you another, an answer to your question is I am from a non-technical background. Right. So whenever you undertake this particular course, there is no restriction on the technicalities. Yes, I would say that there are certain rules where a technical background or a technical understanding of the subject would definitely be required. But when you talk about management, and since management in itself is about managing the people and managing the entire organization, right? So that is where uh, a technical understanding or a degree would not be required. But yes, during the classes, during the sessions that would be conducted, you would be given complete understanding of those technical terms, those technical jargons. You'll be made to understand that if I talk about megawatt, what is probably the relation between a megawatt and a megawatt hour or a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. Right. And just like uh, something that I just said, that if I make a statement, Dr. Naveen understands it, and if Dr. Naveen makes a statement, I understand it you would be in the same zone that you would be in a position to understand the kind of statements that you would be making. Obviously, yes, again, I would like to stress upon the fact that there are certain technical roles for which specific understanding of engineering or specific understanding of the technical side of it would be required. But in general, if you look at it, the power sector is open to non-technical people. The power sector or the power management side is definitely open. And that is what we are practically doing as a part of power management, that during those sessions, you would be informed of various technical terms. You would be explained those technical terms. You'll actually be made to understand that where exactly those technical terms are being used in the industry and how does it affect. So one more thing uh, here I would like to add. Uh, it seemed like that... Uh, I'm from engineering background, but I teach subjects like financing of energy sector projects. So which includes the financing, financing of uh, uh, financial accounting, financial management. So it's the same like if an engineer can uh, uh, learn these subjects, financing subjects, especially financial accounting, and even can teach. So a non-engineering or non-science background person can also learn the technical terms, technology, and they can also learn and as well as they can work. So as such, there is no issue. But yes, they as uh, uh, Namdeep Ji has said that uh, they will have to work. And obviously the classes are for that. Whenever you have any issue, 
if anything you are not able to understand any terminology which you are not able to understand there are people there are faculty there are expert uh which with whom you can discuss and uh, i'm sure that uh, at the last or at the end of the program you will say that yes i am a power manager thank you thank you thank you dr navin for and uh, dr navdeep uh, for explaining uh, the doubts which everyone has uh, who is from non uh, technical background uh, so there are so many questions uh, we are having in the chat box but i'm sorry the time is not permitting us to entertain all these so i would like to uh, conclude the webinar as we know the webinar due to a close uh, it was evident that embracing these emerging technologies is pivotal for the evolution of power sector the collective efforts to implement these as one advancements will play a significant role in shaping a more resilient efficient and sustainable energy landscape for the future the knowledge uh, shared by our experts uh, dr navin and dr navdeep in this webinar i believe that uh, serve as a stepping stone towards a brighter more innovative future uh, of our attendees in the power sector thank you everyone thank you dr navin dr navdeep uh, for sharing your valuable insights and valuable thoughts uh, related to power sector thank you all the attendees uh, for uh, giving your time uh, on these uh, important uh, topics thank you thank you thank you thank you dr komal thank you so